And when you really then think about it, we created in this pandemic a new customer segment, a customer segment that I did not really know. I was always looking at the world from a consumer family entertainment point of view. Welcome to the Modern Selling Podcast, where we help the entire sales community to create more sales conversations with today's modern buyer. This includes anyone from entrepreneurs and business owners to sales reps and sales leaders. Each episode, you will hear from sales leaders, practitioners, and influencers to help you find, engage, connect, and nurture your relationships with your buyers. I'm Mario Martinez Jr., your host, and you're now listening to The Modern Selling Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Postal.io, a sales and marketing engagement platform that generates leads, increases sales, and improves customer retention. Learn how you can integrate direct mail and gifting into your existing sales strategy by visiting Postal.io. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Modern Selling Podcast. And boy, you're in for a treat today. One of the, my favorite things to do on this show is bring in practitioners live from the field. And I've got with me Mr. Christoph Schell, the Chief Commercial Officer at HP. Christoph, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me, Mario. Looking forward to this. So this is a, a real pleasure to spend some time with you. I know it took a little time to get you, a little bit of time, excuse me, to get you uh, coordinated. You're obviously very busy. You've got a, a fairly large organization that you lead, and we're going to be spending some time all, talking all around sales strategy from digital to remote and many of the other things that you guys have done specifically, especially in this pandemic, to really help grow the business despite some of the challenges that many businesses are facing as a result of the market conditions. Uh, but before we get into some of those details, just do me a favor. Talk a little bit about yourself, your background, and then I've got a very special question that I want to ask you. All right, so let's try that. Uh, you can probably hear this, my German accent. I can't hear it, but you guys have to suffer through this. I'm sorry. But yeah, look, I, uh, I'm from Germany. I grew up in a, in a household of an entrepreneur. My dad had a couple of companies, and at a very early age, I, I got involved with business. We had a distribution company for consumer electronics. And I guess the little bit of common sense that I have in my career is from my time with my dad. I then studied business. First job was actually, if you want, I had internships at HP. But when I graduated, HP was on a hiring freeze. So my first job out of uni was with a company called Procter & Gamble. I was in brand management or in facial moisturizers. A very great company. I learned a lot. But I also learned that you need to have a bit of affinity for the product. And Facial moisturizers did not really cut it for me. So HP called me back and I went back to HP. Spent many years there in the Middle East. I was based in Dubai for eight years. I moved to Australia, I moved to Singapore, moved over to the US. Moved back to Australia, uh, sorry, to Singapore. And then in 2012, I left HP. At the end of 2012 to join Philips, where I was EVP of lighting for growth markets. Great business. Uh, this was at a time when lighting had a lot of change. It went from conventional lighting to LED lighting. Uh, that was very interesting. And then in 2014, I came back to HP and moved from Singapore with my family yet again, this time to the Bay Area. And since 2014, I'm with HP. We made a very big change a year ago. Uh, we reorganized the one thing we had not reorganized in all the years that I was involved with HP. And that is we went from three regions to 10 markets. And we call that whole construct a commercial organization. That's what I'm leading uh, with my team. We're responsible for the revenue, the go-to-market, and the margin generation for HP. Got it. And you also have the sales strategy, operations, and enablement in addition to the direct selling organization as well, correct? That's correct. So there's basically three, three pillars under the commercial organization. You have sales and different sales teams that depends on what customer segment we're talking about. And we can probably talk a little bit more about that later. Then I have uh, category teams. Uh, they manage, if you want, the revenue, the margin, the, the four piece in a classic sense. And that has become very important uh, in an omni-channel environment. The consistency of 4P execution um, is, is super critical to what we do. 
And then the third pillar are centers of excellence, uh, centers of excellence around data analytics, pricing, um, sales operations, global accounts. Um, those are the main ones. Gotcha. So as customary, I get the privilege of asking all my guests a very special question. And I, 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 didn't, I don't give you much time to prepare for this. So here we go. Tell us something nobody would know about you even if they were looking at any or all of your social profiles. And I'm looking for something juicy, Christoph. Give me something juicy. <laughs> all right. So nobody knows this because it hasn't happened yet, but it will happen hopefully this weekend. I uh, booked a, a weekend training course for my motorbike license. And this is 22 years in the making. When I met my wife, we had this deal that I would not be riding a motorbike until the kids would be out of the house. And I've accomplished, we've accomplished this this year with my little one being a freshman at Cal Poly. And now I'm doing it. I'm doing this motorbike license. So wish me luck. I'll need all the luck I can get this weekend. Wow, that's fat. So, so, so you've, you've kept this promise for many years, obviously. And I guess your, your wife didn't want you doing it because she didn't want you dead and raising exactly. kids by herself. It was, all about the, it was all about the life insurance premium, I guess. <laughs> 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 well, well, now that the kids are out, now the li- she can claim on the life insurance. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> she get it all to herself. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 I know, I, you know, I'm just playing about that. But that sounds awesome. So, so you've always wanted to – now, uh, you said motorbike, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Look, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a car addict. So I, I love, I love cars. Coming from Stuttgart in Germany, probably it's, it's in my blood. So, I, but I also wa- always wanted to have a, a motorbike and riding a motorbike. And when I was younger, a teenager, I did. But then uh, I met my wife, and this whole thing was off uh, immediately. So I, it was a, it was a key choice point at that point in time. And I decided to acknowledge it and not go for it and not drive motorbikes. And now we are at this time in my life where I think I can do that again. So I'm looking very much forward to this weekend. I admire you. Hats off. That's a, clearly a dream that, and a vision that you've had for a very long time. You've kept your promise and now you're going after it. So I wish you all the safety in the world. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but very cool. So, so that's happening this weekend. And we, we are hearing it first before it actually happens. I like that. Let, so, let's make sure that it actually happens. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do me a favor. I'm not publishing this until after this weekend. So make sure you stay alive. I'll let you know. It's a good idea. (laughs) Exactly. All right. Well, let's get into some, you know, some meat of this discussion here. And, you know, again, as I think about one of our goals here on Modern Selling Podcast is is to really have brought practitioners from the field in, into the, the show and have an opportunity to speak to leaders such as yourself around sales and around some of the challenges that we've had in terms of sales strategy, go to market strategies, especially during this particular pandemic, um, since the pandemic began. And of course, many of us, including myself thought a couple months, we'll be out of this, everything will be fine. And unfortunately it's not going away. And with that said, talk about some of the, some of the most significant changes that you've seen across the uh, commercial landscape since the pandemic began? I think the, the the different sequences here. The first one was really one of immediate necessity to equip our enterprise customers, help them with their business continuity plans. And that was actually, that was Herculean. Uh, moving employees, thousands of employees uh, from an office environment to working from home uh, doing that in a way that was fast, productive, compliant, secure, very difficult to do. You know, we have uh, obviously different verticals that we engage with. Think about banking, for example, or think about call centers that have to uh, deal with credit card information of customers. Uh, how, how do you manage that in a compliant way? And so we were trying to help them as much as we could, not just with, you know, hardware, uh, but also with workflow, uh, where, wherever this, this was possible. And that all doing all of that in a, at a time where, where supply chains were really disrupted from a factory level down to component sourcing, that was not easy. So I think that was, that was the first big, big change uh, when, when the pandemic hit. The second then was learning from home. In different, different countries, different cultures cope with this uh, differently. I have to say, actually, the U.S., was very fast in adapting a, um, a digital, a virtual education philosophy 
Uh, my home country in Germany, not so much. And my sister's a teacher. She's still taking copies and, and printing out pages and delivering them by hand to teach uh, to, to students. It's different, you know, even in, in, in first economy kind of countries. Uh, and then obviously in emerging markets, so much more complex. So that has become a, a real focus, uh, firstly, from a from a hardware point of view, enabling kids to, to learn and giving them access to, to uh, digital learning tools. But then also from a content point of view, how do you move a curriculum uh, to online? Uh, how, how do you manage that in a, in a situation where you have maybe half the class uh, that is online, another half that is in school? So very complex topics to, to, to master. And what actually helped us a lot was the ecosystem that we're working with. I think Microsoft, uh, Google as well, some other third-party education um, partners that we have. So that, that was very helpful. And now you have already something, and that's now the third learning. Um, you, you have this work from home and learn from home um, reality. And when you really then think about it, we created in this pandemic a new customer segment, a customer segment that I did not really know. I was always looking at the world from a consumer family entertainment point of view or from a commercial enterprise, um, medium-sized business point of view. What we now created is this mix of both. I call it prosumer. It's on the one hand side, that employee that works from home and the CIO of the company he works for and us, we're trying to make that as seamless and as productive as possible. But while we do that, we also have to acknowledge the fundamental opportunity that we got because now we have kind of one foot in the door of the entertainment requirements of that employee's family. And how do you cater to that? That has become a fascinating topic over the last couple of months. Interesting. Yes, uh, very familiar with the prosumer modeling. I came from telecom and uh, where I used to manage our, our B2B enterprise wireless side of the business. And we used to talk a lot about the prosumer concept, and that was it's the professional consumer. You buy, in this case, wireless services like you would like a consumer, but now you're trying to apply it in the professional environment. And, and that's a very – this, this particular market that, that um, you're talking about, buying is – when you think about the, the, what, how people buy – is they buy as if they were going to use it themselves. And now when we think about it, with as a result of many people being from work from home, and most people, and as a matter of fact, I would argue, that's exactly how we look at things. Like, how is it going to fit into my work-life balance? <laughs> no longer work-life, but my work-life like, is in personal life uh, balance. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned, Christoph, about the whole supply chain. We have a, a, a center of excellence built out of Latin America in Colombia, as an example. And... For the last two months, I've had one heck of a time trying to upgrade all my machines for uh, being able to operate faster and just getting extra RAM uh, to the machines because of how the supply chain has been affected as a result of the pandemic. And then the learning from home, that is, uh, I think, one of the biggest struggles that many companies have had to face is, is how do I take what used to work in person or what we used to do as uh, you know, work in person workshops, collaboration, team groups, those types of things and bring it home. So it's interesting you, you mentioned that very specifically. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the how, how has the shift to remote working affected your sales strategy uh, on a go-forward basis? So let's talk a little bit about that. So, I mean, different, different angles to take here. The first one is, um, I think a, this pandemic obviously drove a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty for companies, uncertainty for individuals, uncertainties for families. And so this idea of moving from CapEx to OPEX, something that we've done for years in a commercial environment, has now hit this prosumer and this consumer environment. And what I mean by that is that um, we're moving very rapidly into outcome-based value propositions across all customer segments. And in the most flexible business model that I know, which is subscription-based services, which makes us very exciting. It makes us very exciting because you can personalize outcomes. Customers don't feel a burden of having to sign. I mean, you, you're coming from the telco industry. They don't have necessarily in a subscription model this, this, this burden of signing a one or two-year contract. You can cancel the subscription any day of the week. Um, but that also then obviously increases the pressure on uh, us as the vendor to make it relevant every day of the week. Okay, And so doing that is actually super fascinating. It requires us to 
think differently, not just on go to market, but actually on product design. Our focus has become much more on workflow, much more understanding of an overall system rather than just hardware and justice in brackets. And, and that I think is, is, is something that I, I absolutely believe is fascinating. You know, we had this vision that this would happen um, at scale in, in the next years, four to five years, but COVID-19 really has driven this in five months. And so um, we're very happy with some of the subscription services that we have, in particular on our printing business. Uh, we think there's opportunity to learn and bring this also into our personal systems business on the PC side. And then there's another element to this. Uh, you gave a, a very good definition of prosumer. There's actually a second definition of prosumer, and that is um, you leave it up to a prosumer to design their own product. And I think for HP, where this becomes very meaningful is in our 3D printing business, where you can design applications based on a digital workflow and then have a digital output in a digital manufacturing process. And the output device is the 3D printing uh, or the 3D printer in this digital manufacturing process. So we see both notions playing out right now during this pandemic. You know, we were able to use the install base of 3D printers that we have in the market to very quickly move from certain applications like orthodontics that some of our customers did to printing of nose swaps or printing of uh, elbow, elbow door openers in order to uh, make sure that uh, you know, the virus wouldn't spread fast. Um, that was very exciting to see how quickly you can actually turn on a digital manufacturing and a digital manufacturing environment. And if you bring those two things together, the example that you just brought up, that you're waiting in a, what I call an analog uh, supply chain, you're waiting for components, Think about how this could pivot over time if everything's digital and you print certain components, certain applications, where and when you require them. I think that's a very uh, powerful vision to have. Yeah. You know, um, I like what you talked about, about ma making, you know, you're looking to outcome-based um, models, right, for when selling to customers and when developing your strategy. <clears throat> and what customers are looking for is what is, what is the end outcome going to be? and moving to a subscription-based service model. And it's funny because as a training company, traditionally we train and it's usually an event or in the, in the training industry, it's usually an event or uh, a, a year long program. And now we've completely pivoted, which was part of our strategy to begin with to a subscription-based model. But the key question that we always continue to ask uh, ourselves and our customers is what is the recurring value which you talked about making it relevant, not just for when they buy the product, but every single day. Every and day. I, I, that's a very, it's a, it's a very consistent theme that we're seeing uh, is that I think a lot of companies need to ask themselves, what's the recurring value that I'm bringing to this particular organization or to by this particular product or service and the pain that it's particularly solving? Because that is, I think, the name of the game. Uh, you nailed it, is the, out the outcome and then the, especially if there's an ongoing service or price or dollar value, What's the recurring value that you're bringing that justifies the cost? Absolutely. What's the recurring value and how can you, uh, from a sales point of view, how can you sell up uh, in this engagement? You know, the more loyal the engagement is, the higher your chance to increase, let's use this, this old fashioned basket word, okay? But you can increase the basket that you have with one customer at a time. I do believe that the more personalized the offering is, the higher the likelihood of loyalty and basket size going up. So let's talk a little bit about that. I really love what you just said. The more personalized the offering is, and um, it could be anything from computer peripherals to large data infrastructure, you know, data center services, right? T talk about what you mean by the more personalized, because this is a, we're hearing this a lot in the marketplace, personalize, personalize, personalize because of so much noise that's happening on the buying side, right? I get emails, I get phone calls, I get e LinkedIn requests, I get this, I get that. Um, so, so talk a little bit about that personalization and what you mean by that. So I'll, I'll stay with, within you know, the two categories that I know well, printing and, and personal systems. So in printing, HP has a, has a product that we call Instant Ink. And basically you sign you agree to a subscription fee and you can count in the US, we have three different ones to choose from. You pay a monthly fee um, and based on that fee, we enable you to print 50 pages, uh, 150 pages, 300 pages. And 
what happens in the background is that your printer is kind of communicating with an HP cloud. And as soon as your cartridges are 25% fill level, we replenish them for you and we send them to your home. Okay. The cool, th we had this product before COVID-19 and it was really doing well, but during COVID-19, the fact that you don't have to go out shopping for cartridges uh, became a major selling feature. Okay. What was before convenience was now actually a lot more. It had to yeah. do with, health okay and so we see this being a really popular value proposition now there's obviously some level of personalization in it because you can choose which subscription fee you're going to choose but now think about this mario i let's make this up okay but let's say you have you have a big family okay and you have a big family international and you know when 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 holiday comes up you have to you want to send a message to them you want to send them a holiday greeting and we know that you print uh, every year around november december you print holiday greeting cards if i now can offer to you a very personalized value proposition around that task that you have to do either printing it at home or printing it through a service provider of hp but put this all within the subscription that you have Mm. you probably will just press a button and say, yeah, of course I'll do that. Go okay? for it, yeah. And then, and then if, I, if I nourish that, that relationship and go for other events in the year or help you to store your photos and, and get other products to you, um, T-shirts, whatever, we go into adjacency business models. And so that I think is super interesting and it is connecting different value propositions that HP has, but connecting them in a very relevant way to you as one customer. I'll give you another example. Um, on the weekends, when I'm not busy getting my motorbike license, um, I, uh, I like to play FIFA. And because my son has taken the, the PlayStation with him uh, to college, I need to play FIFA on my laptop. Now think about this. During the week, the highest CPU usage that I do on my laptop is probably what I'm doing right now with you on a Zoom call, okay? That's not really a high CPU usage. On the weekend, I need all the power I can get. I mean, you know, right. I need all the memory. I need all the bandwidth, everything that I can get. Now, imagine we find a business model where you don't transact with me on the laptop. Like you don't buy the laptop, but you buy the service of using a laptop. And I may be able to scale this up and down based on uh, the usage patterns that you have. So make this up during the week uh, where your CPU usage is um, uh, moderate. I'll, I'll invoice you $5 a day. Let's make this up, okay? But over the weekend, where it really goes up and you might have to go tap into cloud features in order to optimize, maybe I can even give you coaching on a certain game. For me, it's FIFA. Um, that rate per day goes up. So that's what, what I'm after. I'm trying to transform businesses that are learned transactional businesses, move that into subscription-based businesses and offer services that are relevant to our customers. Go away from this idea of always having to spend CapEx in order to get something done and make it flexible. Make it flexible through annuity-based, outcome-based engagements that are OPEX in nature. So what I hear you saying is find relevancy within your customer base. Yes, and then create, <clears throat> excuse me, and then create solutions that drive subscription or annuity-based revenue models and make it easy to wrap in things that I need on top of, on top of, on top of, which by the way, Instaprint, awesome. yeah. the Insta HP, uh, I've got my HP printer right over here and we actually have that. So, awesome. and, and we, t we turned it on at the beginning of the pandemic, right? So, so, so I, now I have no idea if my wife is, she, she, just, she does all that. But all as I know is we were getting a package from HP and stuff and it was coming in and she's like, it's really great. We got to keep printing. I'm like, oh, I know why. Because we were printing at the beginning with, with school for school and school came up and we started cranking out documents. And I'm like, yeah. you really got to kill this many trees and the, the, the ink is going to be super expensive. And she was like, no, I found this new thing. And they sent us a note about it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty, that's a good idea. Right. Yeah. So I think that that is for me a proof point. And I think uh, given the uh, customer acceptance, I think we are we are onto something that hunts for us in printing. But I think they will also hunt on personal systems. And then very excitingly, even in 3D printing, you know, we have a lot of partners in the 3D printing business that are selling annuities as well. One of our customers is a company called Smile Direct. I mean, they're correcting your teeth. If you want, that's an annuity, too, because I'm. Currently, I went through my six month of uh, correction, 
And now I still need a retainer for a night for while I'm sleeping to make sure that my teeth stay well in place. It's an ongoing relationship. It's an ongoing outcome that I'm after. And I think managing that well um, with through HP and through our partners gives a lot of stickiness, gives a lot of loyalty with our customers. Now, what about your online sales? Have you guys seen a spike or surge in, in that? Yes, absolutely. And so um, the, the key here is, look, HP, we, we do the majority of our business through partners. And so we obviously participate in what we call partner online or marketplaces. I have to say that the growth that we see in marketplaces is, is second to none. And I think we need to bring this up today. It's 11-11, okay? Uh, so a big day in China when it comes to marketplaces, Alibaba, JD, some others. Very exciting to see how these marketplaces are impacting customer choice. And I said this before, they actually had a major impact on the structure of the sales and category organization in HP, so my team, because they're driving a lot of transparency, a lot of transparency on what value propositions are across different countries, uh, across different customer segments. And at the end of the day, every time that you're not consistent in, in making a value proposition understood by your customer, there's opportunity for confusion, there's op opportunity for, for arbitrage. And we've been working, we are working a lot on making sure that we have a globally consistent experience and a globally consistent value proposition. It takes, uh, takes really a lot of effort to manage that across the four P's of marketing, but also from an availability point of view, from a supply chain point of view. And it's, it's one thing to do this in a transactional business model, it's a very different thing to do this in an outcome-based business model because let's talk about your Instant Ink uh, subscription. You have a certain experience living in California. Let's assume you move to Latin America. Can you take that experience with you? And what's the, what's the difference in experience when you are in Latin America? How, you know, how will we make sure that the supply chain is able to deliver the cartridges to, at the exact time when you require it, something that you're used to uh, from your US setup. And I, I'm bringing this up because these are real life uh, examples that we're working through. The pandemic is making this challenging because supply chains are uh, very quickly impacted whenever there's a wave two or wave three. So it's something that we're looking at. But yeah, online uh, has become a very hip uh, go to market. Uh, in the US, I think uh, from my experience, the idea to Inform yourself in your in, during your shopper journey, B2C and B2B online is absolutely through the roof. Placing the order online uh, has increased as well. And then, very interestingly, a lot of customers still like to pick it up. Pick it up in store or pick it up with a service provider, in particular when it's B2B. And that is an interesting dynamic because I, you know, I, I simply don't buy into this notion that online business and marketplace business are the death of brick and mortar retail or are the death of uh, community or local service providers. I think those two things go hand in hand and it is very important to, to do the matchmaking. And I think that's a role that HP that we need to have between our classic partner setup and uh, these marketplaces and also some of our direct, uh, our, our direct efforts. So, Talking about the influence that you guys um, have had, at least on me very specifically, uh, when I found out about the the ability to be able to or, to order the the Insta Ink and that it's coming every however many however often it comes based upon the the levels and that are inside of the printer, um, I said, well, geez, well, one day I ran out of uh, we use uh, castle soap for body wash, you know, for 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 washing our bodies, and then we have a special kind of shampoo and conditioner that my wife wants that's pure organic and pure this and oats and blah 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 inside there. Uh, so uh, we ran out of it, and I said, gosh, boy, it'd be really it'd be really great if we can just say, you know what, I don't want to have to go to in this case Amazon and order it whenever I'm out. It'd be really great that if it came every couple of months when I'm running out. So I didn't really know this, but as I started playing around and I'm like, there's gotta be something like this with, with the whole HP thing. And I went and I was like, oh, sure enough, I could order it. So that's being delivered every couple of months, deodorant, soap, this, that, and the other from, from different sources to be able to have that so that I'm, I'm, I'm pulling that in and I'm not having to worry about this type of stuff. And I thought, boy, this won't change even when it goes back to normal, like because of the convenience factor, right? 
life, I think, has permanently changed in many different ways from a business standpoint and how we buy and from a consumer standpoint and how we buy as well, which does impact our sales team in terms of how they think differently and how they communicate and engage with buyers. Back to your earlier comment about being relevant, you've talked about it from a product perspective. How do we translate that down now to the sales side where we're dealing on, whether it's from a consumer standpoint or let's talk B2B, on the B2B sales side, how do we bring that into that talk track about relevancy to the salesperson so that as we're engaging with our 6.8 or 10 buyers inside of any one buying decision, that we're bringing that relevancy into the discussion and showcasing subscription value and those types of things. Is that something that you do differently from a learning perspective? We were talking about that learning from home. Do you do anything differently? And before you answer that question, I want to take a break and have you all listen to this message from our program sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Postal.io, a sales and marketing engagement platform that generates leads, increases sales, and improves customer retention. Postal allows you to automate and personalize your offline outreach to both existing customers and new prospects at scale. Learn how you can easily integrate direct mail, gifts, charitable donations, and even alcohol into your existing sales, marketing, and retention strategies. Visit postal.io today and request a demo so you can boost your pipeline and close more deals. Right before that break, I was going to have you answer a question on bringing relevancy down to the sales conversation and how to get your sellers to do that. Talk a little bit about that. Is that even of a concern? Did you even have to think about that? And if so, how did you solve that problem? I actually think it's a, it's a key concern. And what I'm learning as a German in in the U S it's not a concern. It's an opportunity really. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, semantics. (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about this. Um, Number one, I think, you said this, you need to have a value proposition that is relevant, okay? We talked about this. The next piece now, however, becomes, okay, we are are moving from a transactional sale to an outcome-based sale, and and that is a very different pitch. That also requires many times a different engagement. You know, a transactional sale in B2B very often happens with a procurement team. An outcome-based sale doesn't happen with the procurement team. It happens at sea level. It happens with the department heads that actually want to have the outcome, okay? And uh, it is a relationship that um, requires daily, weekly interaction because when you get the award, that's when the sales starts, okay? Uh, Not before when you, in the transaction engagement, when you drop the hardware, that was it, okay? Very different, very different way of of, of interacting with the customer. That's one. The second piece is, and this is the amazing thing during COVID-19, and what you and I are doing right now, we're talking to one another over Zoom, a very virtual engagement. It's actually fun because we can look one another in the eye because you and I both switched our cameras off. Have you ever pitched to somebody when the camera is off? It's a night difficult. <laughs> it's an absolute nightmare. I mean, you yeah. can't read the facial expression. You can't read the body language. As a matter of fact, you don't even know if they hear you. Okay. And I mean, I had the situation where I'm asking, guys, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, then I continue. And after 45 minutes of pitching, you are mentally dead because it's so exhausting to do this. So the opportunity that we have to embrace is to stand out. And the only way to stand out is to create a relationship prior to having a talk. And you and I did this just before your podcast started. We, we talked for 10 minutes and got to know one another. In a commercial engagement, that's a little bit more difficult. So you actually, I've learned, my team has learned and has taught me as well. The best way to do this is to use social media and to start the engaging not 10 minutes earlier, sometimes start it 10 weeks earlier. Try to understand who the decision makers are. Try to understand what really is important in their lives. You know, are they, are they into motorbike riding? Do they play the drums like I do? What is it? What, what, at what level can you connect? What social media are they using? You know, I'm very difficult on social media because I don't have Facebook, but I'm on LinkedIn, okay? So how, how can I reach them? And then try and try it sustainably, not just send one message and then back off. 
Try and engage. Try and build a report. Try and understand what is important to them. The difference is when you then get to the pitch, when you then get to the engagement, they actually know you. And sometimes they admit that they, that they know you. Sometimes they don't, but you know subconsciously they know who you are because there was a bit of an exchange. And so the idea of social selling, I think, is super important. The complexity of social selling is you are now mixing the brand with your own brand because it's, it's you that is personally engaging, but I'm representing a company. You are representing a company. And this you can't fake. This is actually quite difficult. The, the values that the brand stands for, you need to associate with those because you cannot fake it, okay? And that becomes Herculean in its, in, its, in its effort because it's something that you need to sustain. You cannot change your personal brand. Uh, there's a digital footprint and you need to be consistent with what you said. Doing this is, is I think it's an art, to be honest with you. It's an art that... You're probably a bit younger than me, but my generation, it doesn't come naturally. <laughs> we need to learn it. This is actually where it's very helpful to have diverse teams and to learn uh, from, from the diverse members in the teams and to help one another. And what I mean by that is I encourage my team to be on LinkedIn. I encourage my team to comment on something I say in order to amplify it. And I do the same. And I think... That actually is something that had you told me three years ago, Christoph, why are you spending one and a half hours a day on LinkedIn? Isn't that a waste of time? Three, four years ago, I might have said, yeah, you're absolutely right. Today, bring it on. I mean, it, I, I have witnessed how you can sell through social media. And the funny thing is, having worked in retail, selling on social media is as exciting as having a customer pick up a box and bring it to the cashier and paying. It's the same. It's the same high that you get. And when you get a, a customer to reply back to you and say, "Hey, I just went out. I just went to Best Buy or Staples or whoever, and I bought what you recommended." It's it's the same sales experience that you have, or that I know from a brick and mortar engagement or from a from B two B engagement in the past. So it's funny you mentioned that, Christoph. So when we started Ingresso, and everybody who follows the shows. The, the, excuse me, the show, when we started it about almost four years ago, I truly believe that we were ahead of our time. We predicted that the world would go all digital, that mm -hmm. sales training would no longer be done in person for the most part. Everything would be done virtual through virtual instructor-led training programs. And I was evangelizing uh, along with my fellow co-founders that if a sales leader was not engaged on LinkedIn and or Twitter and or social media sites and leveraging video, uh, to engage with their buyers, that they would be obsolete in five years. So that was three, about a little over three and a half years ago. Now, of course, we did not predict the pandemic, but to, to your point, up until February of this year, approximately 60% of my executive meetings with leaders such as yourself and myself that are the age 45 and older, we didn't grow up selling this way. We didn't understand how to leverage these types of omni-channel approach, social media, video, text, uh, all these other channels. 60% of my meetings were spent trying to convince sales leaders our age that we needed to be on this platform. Yes. 30 days later, 0% of my conversations. Now sales leaders are like, oh my God, what did I do? I, I need my sellers to be able to learn how to develop the skill. Uh, they need to be able to have the art of being able to engage. You know, can they just go in and pitch? Should they just send a message? They, Let me meet with you now. No, it's like the dating process. Well, how do I date right? How do I actually engage right? So it's interesting you mentioned that because I think a lot of sales leaders still today are struggling. And with that struggle, uh, they are trying to find anything to make it stick. And you've raised a really, really good point. And what I loved the most, and I, I, I'm going I'm to take that and put it as my little clip. <laughs> what I love the most about what you said is that you're spending an hour and a half a day on LinkedIn. And what you said was, is you're working on finding leads and opportunities and engaging in conversations. And I think in my opinion, that is one of the missing links by most executive sales leaders. And if I were to look at 100 executive profiles, I'm going to go off on a whim here. I'll probably have to prove this myself, but probably 60 to 70% of them are not engaged today through social media on behalf of their sales team. 
And I, yeah. I think that's a travesty, a big mistake. Right, it's a missed opportunity. Uh, Huge. It's a missed opportunity for the company to be different, to have a differentiator with decision makers in companies that you're selling to, that's number one. And also in a one-to-many kind of effort, explaining what the real values of a brand are. Because I mean, that's the other thing that is standing out during, during COVID. I think society has kind of taken a different approach on what it means to be able to trust the brand. And, and being able to convey that, social media is really the best platform to do that, okay? And if you do it consistently, if your team does it also consistently, it helps. It significantly helps. But to be honest with you, I mean, it's one thing about the leaders, but let's face it. I mean, it really requires the entire team, sales, category, supply chain as well, all need to embrace it. And it's actually very interesting to see how, how people have reinvented themselves in, 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 in calendar year 20. You know, how people that really were driving in the past to sell because of relations that, that they had, to change that, to move the relationships to virtual relationships, to uh, exaggerate now, to move from playing golf uh, with a customer to data analytics. Very exciting to, to see what people are able to do, what people are able to learn. And one more comment, just bringing it back to something that we said at the very beginning, this education segment, this learning from home segment. You know, Mario, what is really cool about this is it's, it's actually maybe it's not so cool for kids to learn from home, but it has enabled a whole new thought about education for a generation that was out of education. It's so easy now to do this, to do, take an evening class, to connect online. We can't do anything anyways. We can't go on vacation. There is no business travel. I might as well, when I'm not doing my motorbike license, I might as well take another class at a university and learn a trick or, or two. And I think that's exciting. It has opened whole new verticals, whole new opportunities. Um, and it's super, I, I think it's super meaningful to, to help customers to bring that to life and to help them manage these outcomes that they want. I absolutely agree with you. I know within even our own organization, which is very small in comparison to HP, but many of our folks have started asking for, hey, would you help fund the development of this, this, and this, and this course, because this is going to help me with this, this, and that. And yes, the answer is yes. Like the more you learn, the better off you'll be for us. And of course, maybe one day you might leave us. Sure. But in the meantime, we'll get yeah. the benefits of that, right? Same for us. You know, I mean, it's, it's the yin and yang of, of the pandemic. Yes, you have a couple of in HP. We have obviously businesses that are essential, but we also have businesses that are a little bit more muted. And being because of, you know, look at office, uh, offices not, uh, not being filled with employees because they're working from home. So obviously the demand is changing. And so the amount of requests I had from leaders in my organization, from single contributors in my organization to move from their center of expertise to something else where they saw the heat is, I think was, was awesome. And being able to, to enable that, being able to help them with that experience and telling them, hey, you know, we shift you back when the time is right. I, I think that's awesome to, to see the agility playing out in the sales force and the hunger of people to learn a new trick. I really think is very rewarding. Yeah, I love what you said too, because once it's one of the things we did um, during the pandemic, um, fortunate for us, based upon our predictions of what would happen four year, almost four years ago in five years in advance, we did a lot of the things up front, which is virtualized our entire business. We have no office space. And we also virtualized all of our training programs. And while a lot of our sales training partners thought we were crazy for going away from in-person events, turns out on April 1st, <laughs> 2020, we were actually cranking because everybody started needing digital skills and they needed it virtually. All right. So we were, in, we were, we were, we were positive then, but with that in mind, one of the things we did was, is we looked at our sales organization and said, we had a model that, you know, looked like the SMB here, the mid market here, the enterprise here. And we said, no, 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 we're going to collapse this. We're going to put all of our players in the spots that we think are going to be the high growth areas based upon what's coming in, what the, the interests are. And we will put our, you know, all of our aces there. And if we need to reorganize back to a different model, we'll reorganize later on. But we got to be fast about capitalizing on the opportunity and or if you're a company that wasn't capitalizing on opportunity, meaning you were suffering, you've got to be fast about pivoting to understand what your use case is. And I'll give you a very specific example. My wife found a, a distributor that only distributes like food supplies to restaurants. Mm -hmm. And it was named as Cheetah. And Cheetah decided, 
we're not getting business from restaurants because restaurants are closed down. Ever so they pivoted their entire business to sell all their, their, their stock and supplies to the general public. And we were ending up with 25, 30, 60 pounds worth of oxtails and this, that, the other at wholesale prices. And so we went out and had to go buy another freezer to be able to stock up for food. It was like, it was a whole pivot in their business model. And that's what it requires for us to be lean and mean in terms of pivoting, which well, also... I I, sorry, I, did that, I did something very similar. The problem was I didn't stay so lean, you know. I ate so <laughs> much that I needed to go to all these subscription services to get rid of it again. <laughs> so I'm still working on it. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I, I put on a dress shirt the other night and I said, you know, I really can't keep this top button button too long. <laughs> so so uh, I know we're running out of time here, Christoph, but can you touch a little bit about, we talked on the leaders in social selling and we didn't touch on partners and what you've done for digital engagement, but we also didn't touch on the sellers as well. Do you also see as, you know, the senior leader of, of HP, I heard you say that you're encouraging the sellers. Is this now a requirement, meaning to be socially engaged, digitally connected, video engaged with your buyers? Do you think it's now a requirement in this era that we're living in for sellers to, to, to be those things that I just mentioned? and engaging with their buyers in that way. Yes. And, and I think, you know, not all of it is because of COVID. I think when you made your plan, there was no COVID inside. I think it has a lot to do with the generation, the generational change on how how service is consumed and how, because of that, the buying behaviors are changing, how trust is established between a buyer and a seller and a brand. So I would say, yes, it is a requirement. And then I would probably nuance it by saying it depends a little bit on what culture uh, and what culture we are operating. There are cultures that are a little bit more conservative because they don't want to share uh, as much, but then there are cultures that are really open uh, to sharing. And I think obviously this is why it's important to understand locally what's going on. You don't want to alienate by requesting too much or sharing too much. It needs to always be put into a local context. And I think that finding the right balance here is super important. It helps this, for this reason that you cannot consolidate, you cannot centralize your sales force. If you have a global sales force like us, it's important to keep them in the country, keep them in the key cities, have them in the social context of that city, and then allow them to engage, teach them on how to engage, but also teach them about the values of HP. Uh, because you don't want these brand ambassadors to um, to be inconsistent with uh, with the with the values of the brand, the values that that we have in HP, and so that that work shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, because each of us is now a representative and a representative that is leaving more and more of a digital footprint. Uh, one last, well, actually, two last questions. But on this topic, you wrote about the future of social selling. Talk about it. What is it? Well, the future of social selling is that what we are currently doing, I think the idea is that we're just scratching the surface. Okay. And so I think that the future of social selling is that you will have a direct touch through social selling channels with every single customer. And I think it's important to say single customer because the value propositions, they need to be, they will be more and more personalized. Okay. The examples that we talked earlier on about. That is one piece. The, the second piece is this idea of everything moving to a subscription, everything moving to an outcome, and everything mo moving to an annuity. Um, very interesting from an engagement point of view, from a value proposition point of view, but also super interesting from a product design point of view. The importance of selling systems, selling workflows in tech are, are really amazing. And the, the, the role the cloud will play, the role that data privacy will play are, are, very, are very complex, uh, but also very exciting to get your head around. Because of that, the impact on, on design, on roadmaps, on in HP, the work we do in our labs is changing. It's, it's really changing because of what we see in COVID-19. It's accelerating. And then the last piece is obviously a financial piece. Uh, now we're moving to outcome-based businesses, which means we can only ever recognize the revenue and the margin in the future on these engagements as they are generated, okay? So it's also for us from a financial performance point of view, we basically live off the loyalty that our customers give us back. And so the financial performance of the companies 
not just ours, all companies in the future will be more and more dependent on the outcomes we are able to consistently deliver. So it has a, it has a significant impact. Fabulous conversation. And especially coming from a senior leader like yourself, I, I feel like it's like I finally feel like that hallelujah moment that it's like somebody else is waving that flag other than just myself. I love it. If somebody wants to connect with you, obviously you said you're on LinkedIn. Uh, yes. Is the best way to, to reach out and send a personalized connection request on LinkedIn? I think so, yeah. It's probably the easiest. And, and, and when you guys do, please make sure you say to Christoph that you heard him on the Modern Selling Podcast. Make sure you personalize that message so he knows. And if you're trying to sell to him, you better make sure you've listened to this entire podcast so that you know what his hot buttons are. <laughs> uh, so uh, Christoph Schell, S-C-H-E-L-L, we'll make sure in the show notes, guys, that are listening in and gals, that uh, we put uh, his LinkedIn profile inside there. Christoph, one last question uh, for you, and that is your all-time favorite movie, what is it? You know, that's actually a problem, Mario, because you told me at the very beginning that I should think about it, and that's what I've been doing now for 60 minutes in the back of my head. What movie? Uh, what movie is my favorite movie? Because there are so many uh, movies that I really like. I will go with one just because I probably watched it for the 101st time um, over the weekend. Alien. I really like Alien. I like the Gordon Weaver. That's where it started. But now I actually like to watch them in the true sequence <laughs> Okay, <laughs> of it. Probably I shouldn't do this, um, but I think it's, um, it's fascinating. So it's a, it's a movie sequel, I guess, that I, that I enjoy a lot. I gotcha. There you have it. Alien. I don't think we've had that one on the show. Uh, for all of you listening in right now, don't turn that dial. Mr. Christoph Shell was on with, with us. Make sure you listen to this very important message from our program sponsor. Don't forget to visit postal.io to learn how you can integrate direct mail and gifting into your existing strategy. Postal.io is a sales and marketing engagement platform that generates leads, increases sales, and improves customer retention. Thanks for listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Please do me a huge favor and give the Modern Selling Podcast a rating and review on iTunes. I would appreciate it. Also, if you want to easily find our show, just go to themodernsellingpodcast.com. Hey, since you'll be on our site, be sure to check out our Modern Marketing Engine podcast hosted by my co-founder and CMO, Bernie Borges. Thanks for listening in. And until the next episode, good selling.